My friends and I grew up in Oz, in a pretty run-of-the-mill suburban area. Our circle of friends was large back in the day, but the four core members in our little unit were myself and my three best friends, Johnny, Kev, and Seth. We were 16 years old at the time and having a movie night at Seth's house. His parents had gone off to Perth for the weekend, and we had the whole place to ourselves. Well, not just us. Seth was looking after his German Shepherd, a big old dog called Bonzo. When we had all arrived, our first move was obvious. Help ourselves to Seth's dad stand stock of booze. We spent the next few hours playing video games, roasting each other, and fawning over Margot Robbie in The Wolf of Wall Street. We got about halfway through the movie when there was an unexpected knock on the door. Seth looked confused. He wasn't expecting any more visitors. At his request, I got up and went to the door with him. Maybe we've been making too much noise and his neighbors were coming over to complain. No, standing there on the porch was a Domino's pizza delivery man. He's holding a large pizza box in his hands. Hey, large pepperoni, paid for online? Uh, what the hell? We hadn't even thought about ordering a pie. Well, as we all know, 16-year-olds and pizzas are natural allies, so we happily took it off his hands. I mean, prepaid. It was like a gift from the gods themselves. Who were we to say no? Uh, hmm, yeah, man, that's ours, Seth says. He gives him a couple of bucks for his troubles. You boys have a good night, the guy says, and heads back to his vehicle. We bring the pizza into the living room and tell the other two how we just lucked out. A massive pizza for just the cost of a tip. Damn, I couldn't even remember the last time I had one of those bad boys. Well, Kev, Mr. Goody Two Shoes as always, says that we shouldn't just eat somebody else's food. We were moral men after all. He says that the delivery driver couldn't have gotten far and that there was still time to get him to come back. It was the right thing to do. Plus, if the store realized we'd stolen one of their pizzas, they may not deliver to Seth's house anymore. In the end, Kev managed to convince us. I guess we weren't assholes after all. The four of us left the pizza on the coffee table and went into the kitchen to call up the pizzeria. We got through to them and tell them that somebody else's pizza had been dropped off at our place and that the guy should come back and get it and take it to whichever hungry customer had ordered it. They asked for our address, and Seth tells them, Are you sure it's a Domino's pizza? Yeah, mate. It's got your logo on the box. We haven't had any orders from that part of town all day. None of our drivers have been around there. Are you sure it's not a Pizza Hut box or something? Dude, I know what your pizzas look like. The delivery guy had your uniform on and everything. Well, maybe it's from one of our other stores. We'll ask around and get back to you. We were all a little perplexed, mainly because we knew that no other Domino stores delivered to our area. Figuring this was all just some dumb mix-up, we decide to give them 10 minutes to call us back. If they didn't, well, we just dug in. In the meantime, we fixed ourselves some snacks for the rest of the movie. We head back into the living room and are shocked by what we find. Bonzo the dog had stuffed his face into the box and eaten half of the bloody pizza. Some poor guy had just paid for Seth's dog to eat a sultan's feast. As funny as it all seemed, we were slightly annoyed that our good deed had gone unrewarded. I mean, if someone in the house was going to eat the pizza, we would have rather it being us. The store never bothered to call us back, so we forgot about the whole thing and just got back to watching the movie. It's not long afterwards that the dog started to become noticeably distressed. He starts whimpering and whining and clambers off to the kitchen. Must be the pizza, we thought. Well, he could wait. It was his own fault, after all, and that juicy scene was coming up in the movie. You know which one I mean. In hindsight, we shouldn't have waited. Ten minutes later, we realized that Bonza was really ill. 
Thinking he must have gorged himself to the point of near death, we googled for an emergency vet in the area. We found one, and the four of us rushed him there as quickly as we could. Bonzo really wasn't at the point of death when we brought him in, but it wasn't for the reason we expected. The vet said that he was displacing unusual symptoms, convulsing and alike, so we ran a few more tests. What we found churned our stomachs. Traces of strychnine were found in Bonzo's system. It's a seriously dangerous poison used for killing birds and rodents. When ingested by humans, it causes your body to spasm, your eyes to protrude from your skulls, and your brain and other organs to shut down. It only takes about 30 minutes to kill you. We later found out that the cheese on the pizza had been laced with it. Seth's parents came home as soon as they found out and we told the police everything we could remember about the guy who gave the pizza to us. Sadly, nothing ever came of it in the end. There were no other reports of anyone receiving a poisoned pizza and it seems like the guy never tried to pull this trick again. And this was just a one-off attack of opportunity. It makes me wonder, did the guy specifically target us, thinking that some dumb kids would just selfishly eat a pizza someone else ordered? If so, does that mean he'd been watching us? How else would he have known that Seth's parents weren't in? Could he have been someone they knew? The mind boggles. I'm happy to report that Bonzo did indeed survive the ordeal. If only just we had arrived at the vets five minutes later, it's unlikely he would have pulled through. The thought that somebody might target others for no apparent reason terrifies me. If anyone brings food to your door that you didn't order, do the right thing and check what the company it's from. It just might save your life. When I was 20 years old, so six years ago, I worked as a delivery girl for a pretty popular pizzeria in my area. Initially, I worked the late morning to mid-afternoon shift, but when the guy who delivered for the night shift ended up getting fired for losing his license, I was placed on the night shift. I really didn't want that shift, because you never know if people who order late at night actually want a pizza, or if they have other intentions in mind. Unfortunately, my boss was an asshole and essentially told me that if I wasn't willing to take the night shift, I was fired. I wasn't exactly in a position where I could be out of work, albeit temporarily, so I reluctantly worked the shift. The first month of this shift went by without any issues. That is, until I had to deliver a pizza to a house that just barely made our delivery radius. I punched it into our GPS, and the house was located in a pretty suburban part of the city. I arrive, and it's about 11pm. The block was extremely quiet, decently lit, and mostly littered with modern townhouses. The house I delivered to was a duplex. I ring the doorbell and wait for about 30 seconds. No answer. I ring it again and wait about another 30 seconds. Still, no answer. I'm standing there, getting pretty nervous that something's about to go down. But, thankfully, a man opens the door. He looked like he was in his late forties. He was pretty tall, maybe a little over six foot, and he was very skinny. I tell him his pizza is here, and he just stands there, staring at me. I ask him if he's okay, and he responded by saying, yeah, I'm fine. Sorry. I got off work not too long ago, and I'm zoning out a bit. Fair enough, I suppose. He hands me the money. I hand him the pizza. And as I'm making change, he says, You're really beautiful, you know that. Not really thinking too much into it, I thanked him for the compliment and gave him his change. I said goodnight, and he did too. I walked back to my car and finished my deliveries for the night. A few days later, I get a delivery order to the same place. I head over there around the same time as last time, and again ring the doorbell. 
He answers the door very excitedly and said, Hey, it's you again. How are you? I told him I was tired and that I couldn't wait to go home, which he chuckled at. I know that feeling pretty well, he said as he was pulling out his wallet. As he's counting his money, he asks what my name is. Being kinda tired at this point, and not really thinking too straight, I stupidly tell him my name. As I'm making change, he asks if he could have my number, as he'd, quote unquote, love to hang out with someone as gorgeous as I am. Whoa, buddy, pump the brakes. I've literally only met this guy like twice to deliver a pizza. I had no idea who this guy was, and I'm positive he barely knew who I was as well. Another thing to mention is that I looked way younger than I was at the time. I was told by numerous people that I still looked about 15, and I was hoping that he thought differently, and wasn't hitting on me because he thought I was a teenager. I'm just standing there awkwardly for a few seconds, before I muster out. Sorry, I have a boyfriend. He gets upset and says, Oh, okay, I see. We stand there in silence before I tell him to have a good night and walk back to my car. He says nothing and still stands at the doorway, staring at me until he finally went back inside once I started my car. I got a pretty creepy vibe from this guy and even brought it up with my co-workers. They agreed it was pretty creepy. They all agreed that is, except for my boss, who overheard everything and claimed that I was just making up stories for sympathy. Fucking arsehole. A week later, I'm working the night shift, and we get an order from that same guy again. This is when shit really hits the fan. I arrive at the house around 10.30pm. Keep in mind that from my perspective on the road, it didn't look like a single light in that house was on. I get out of my car and I walk up to the front door with the pizza box. As I'm approaching the door, it quickly swings open to reveal the man. Except this time, he was wearing a suit. I jumped back. He laughs and says, Sorry if I scared you. I saw you out of the window and figured I'd just open the door now so you wouldn't have to ring the bell. I was getting scared because, as I mentioned before, there were no lights on in his house whatsoever. He was just sitting in the dark this whole time? If so, why? I nervously laugh and say, it's okay. He asked me if I liked his suit, to which I said, yes. He then asks me, Would you like to go on a date with me tonight? What the fuck? I once again tell him that I have a boyfriend, to which he chuckles, gets close to me, and says, Honey, there's no way a girl your age is in a serious relationship. If you go on a date with me, I'll show you how a real man treats a girl. He grabs the pizza box from me and throws it to the side. He then grabs me by my arms, hard. I'm officially shitting bricks at this point, and trying not to cry from the fear that was overwhelming me. I start pleading with him. Dude, please, I just want to go home. I don't want to go on a date tonight. He just stares at me with the most sinister look I have ever seen on someone's face, and says, I don't care. Get inside, now. We're gonna have a good time. He starts trying to pull me into his house, and I'm trying to resist as hard as I can. After a bit of struggling, he lets go of one of my arms. I did something that to this day, I am thankful worked. I used my free arm to punch him as hard as I could in the stomach. This stuns him for a few seconds, and he loosens his grip on me, allowing me to break free. I quickly run to my car, and as I get in, he runs at me. I grab a half-empty bottle of soda I had in the cup holder and throw it. Luckily, it hits him in the head and he lets go. I slam the door. I put the car in reverse and quickly back out of the spot, reversing down the road with him desperately trying to hold on. 
He's banging on my hood, screaming, Stop the f***ing car! I turn onto the next road as swiftly as possible, and luckily, he falls off the hood of my car. I slam the gas as hard as I could to get as far away from that sick bastard as possible. In my panicked state, I drove a couple of blocks down the street and kept making turn after turn onto other side blocks as I feared he was following me. Eventually, I reached a red light and I slammed on the brakes and just sat there at the intersection, frozen from what had just happened. Once the light turned green, Eventually, I get the energy to drive back to the pizzeria, and almost immediately after I walk in, my co-worker knew that something was wrong with me. My co-worker comforted me, and my boss surprised me, and began apologizing profusely for what had just happened, and for putting me on the night shift. He takes me into the office, and handed me the phone to call the cops. They arrive at the store, and I give them my statement, and any scratches on my car. My co-worker followed me as I drove home, and I collapsed on my bed. Strangely enough, I managed to fall asleep. I quit my job the next day, and luckily, a friend of mine managed to hook me up with a new job at her clothing store. As far as the psycho goes, two days later, I received an update from the police. The entire duplex was owned by the guy's brother, who lived on the right side with his wife. The psycho lived on the left side of the duplex. I learned that he had been in and out of jail constantly, at first for robberies and assaults, but later on. He had been released from jail for about five months before this encounter. When the cops arrived at the house, he was long gone, and his family had no idea where he had run off to. The police insisted that they would find him. Indeed, they did. Apparently, the guy had fled to a nearby city, and attempted to kidnap a teenager walking alone late at night on the street. Luckily, somebody happened to be looking out their window at the right time. They called the cops, and the police caught him trying to force her into his car. I thanked the officers for everything they had done and for informing me, and I walked out of the station. I walked down the street and light up a cigarette, taking in everything I had just been told. I felt relieved that he couldn't hurt anyone anymore. I was relieved that I would never have to encounter him again and reliving what had happened that night. My last experience two years before this was scary, but I think this one takes the cake as being the scariest, as I was alone and face to face with a psycho. Who knows where I'd be if he managed to pull me inside that house. I was 18 or 19 years old when this happened, still living with my parents in Billings, Montana. We were hosting a foreign exchange student, Fei, a girl from China who was the same age as me. Her English was pretty good, so we became friends. Now I'm a guy, but there was nothing going on between us. She was more like a little sister figure to me, seeing how she lived at my house and all. Anyway, the two of us snuck out one night to go to this party. We got home late around 1am I think, and we both quietly walked up the stairs and tried not to wake my parents. Faye silently crept into her bedroom down the hallway, and I went inside mine and hopped into bed. I was so tired that I drifted off to sleep within minutes. I don't know what time it was, but I was awoken in the middle of the night by the sound of creaking in my bedroom. I woke up groggy with my eyes tired from sleep and scanned the room around me. The sound was coming from my closet door, which was slowly creeping open. There, emerging from my closet, was the dark outline of a human with a weird-shaped head. Now, I suffer from sleep paralysis from time to time, which means I often wake up with audio-visual hallucinations in the middle of the night. I quickly rationalized that the figure in my room wasn't real, and that the closet hadn't really opened. I was just in that place that's neither dream or reality. Even though I've had these experiences a lot of times in the past, it was still creepy to see the dark silhouette of a person looming out of my closet. I kept my eyes on the spectre as it slowly tiptoed to the end of my bed. 
it stopped facing towards me and began swaying from side to side. I closed my eyes, desperate to fall back to sleep and get rid of this nightmare creature at the foot of my bed. As I did, I heard its fake footsteps slowly backing out of my room towards the hall. Good. It would disappear soon, I thought. Then I heard the sound of my bedroom door carefully being closed. What the? Something wasn't right about this hallucination. It wasn't like all the others. Every time, the figure would just dissolve and fade away as reality took over, but this one legitimately just exited my room. Now, sure that I was fully awake, I decided to get up out of bed. I walked towards my closed bedroom door and quietly opened it. There, standing in the hallway, opening the door to Faye's room, was the same dark figure. It wasn't a hallucination after all. It was a man, a stranger in our house, creeping into my friend's bedroom. I let out a loud, hey, which of course startled the guy. He dropped something on the floor. In the dark, I couldn't make out what it was. I hit the hallway light switch on my left. The hall lit up. I could see him clearly now. His head wasn't weirdly shaped at all. He was wearing a mask, holding some sort of small club in his hand. On the floor by his feet was a small length of rope. From inside her room, I heard Faye let out a terrified scream. She must have woken up during the commotion. The masked man darted down our staircase. In all honesty, I had no idea how to react. I just stood there like a rabbit in headlights, totally shocked that this wasn't sleep paralysis after all. My father came storming out of my parents' bedroom at the far end of the hall. I screamed that a man was just in my room and that he was about to go into face. He rushed back into his bedroom, came out with his firearm, and made his way down the stairs after the guy. We heard the roar of a car engine outside. The intruder had parked his ride somewhere near our house. I heard no shots, no shouting. My dad didn't make it outside fast enough to catch the guy or spot his plates. To this day, we still have no idea who he was, if he lived near to us, why he targeted us, nothing. The only time the house was empty that day was around 2pm, meaning this guy either snuck inside while we were at the party and my parents were sleeping, or he'd been hiding inside our house for around 12 hours, biding his time. From what the cops think, he came to get Faye, to knock her out with the club and tie her up, take her out to his car and drive off. Thing is, when he broke in, he hid in the closet in the wrong room. He stood at the end of my bed, trying to work out if I was Faye in the dark, probably thinking if he should bludgeon me or not. I have no idea what motivated the guy. Infatuation? Hatred? Who knows? But the fact that he brought rope and a cudgel with him, and hid silently inside our house for what must have been hours, leads me to think his intentions were pure evil. Faye moved back to China soon after that. I miss her, but I can't say that I blame her for leaving. I mean, wouldn't you? About three weeks ago, my mum told my brother and I this story. Sally is a lifelong family friend. She would frequently visit her friends and family in Oklahoma. We live in a small town in southern Ontario, Canada. So, Sally would drive. Sally would drive straight 20 hours at least overnight to get from our town to another small town. She did this to save money, and obviously she wanted to arrive as soon as possible. Now that you've heard the prelude, here's the story. About 30 years ago, she decided to head south for a visit. No big deal, she's done this a few times now. So she packs up and heads out. At some point, after driving about 14 or 15 hours, she started getting pretty tired. Being as it was probably the 80s, it was a little safer. So she decided that she would stop at a rest stop for the night to get some sleep and resume again first thing in the AM. She parks in a very well lit and busy rest stop. She parks right by the lights and felt at ease because there was an abundance of travellers stopping and going. 
She gets out of her car for a bathroom break, comes back, and settles in her car. About then, an RV pulls up beside her, and an elderly couple get out. The man asks her about coming from Canada. They strike up a little conversation. Nothing odd. The couple just talk to Sally for a little bit. They tell her that they're driving from the south, going north, and they just needed to have a sleep for the night. They wanted to talk because they were unsure if the rest stop was okay to stop at. They say good night and good trip, and the couple head back to their RV. Sally locked her doors up and went to sleep. Two or three hours later, Sally woke up with a really unsettling feeling. She looks around. Nothing. A few people going in the stop. Parking lights are all on. She assumes she's just feeling bad because she's tired and her car isn't the best place to sleep in. After ten minutes, she actually said that this feeling got worse, and it was a jarring, queasy, uneasy feeling. She sits back and tries to shrug it off. This doesn't work, and apparently she had every red alarm and instinct telling her that she needed to go. She panics, starts her car and peels off. She doesn't care where, she just knew that she needed to get away from there. About 20 miles down the road, she finds a motel and gas station. She decides to see if she could get a room there for what little money she had. She converses with the person in charge. He cuts her a deal because he doesn't want to see a young woman driving alone late at night. She gets a key, pops in her hotel room, and sleeps for the night. No issues whatsoever. Around 9am, she wakes up, showers, changes clothes, and decides to relax for a few. She turns on the TV, and what she said was on it actually gave me chills. There was a breaking news story about an elderly couple who had been killed in the middle of the night. The news shows the RV that Sally was parked next to in the exact same spot at the exact same stop. She even sees the fast food drink cup that she dropped by accident that rolled under her car. Sometime during the night, a man broke into their RV and killed them, and then simply left. Presumably this all happened right before Sally had left. The man was never caught, and Sally, since then, stopped at hotels for the night and avoided rest stops. JF lives in a small area of Texas called Del Valle, where there is little more than gas stations, schools, houses, and cows. She usually considered this place rather boring, but one night a few days before Halloween would change all that for her. On this night, JF was driving her boyfriend to his house at about 8.30 p.m. Being a person who says she can almost always sense immediate danger or evil, JF's heart began to beat rapidly. For some unknown reason, chills ran down her spine, and she began to perspire, even though she had the car's AC on full blast. I was getting an eerie feeling that something evil was up ahead, she says. We are all familiar with how an animal's eyes glow in a creepy way when a light is shown into them. Up the hill, about two minutes from my house, a black dog walked right in front of my car, JF says. She thought it was peculiar that the animal was just casually walking across the road without any apparent fear of getting hit by her car. I hit the brakes and managed to stop about five feet from the dog, she remembers. It just stood there and stared at me. I turned on my high beams, and when I saw its eyes, they turned a golden reddish tint. It stood there for about a minute, then walked away. I hit the gas and sped off, terrified. 
but when I looked back, the dog was nowhere in sight. JF proceeded home, but could not shake the weird feeling of dread that overcame her before and during her encounter with that black dog. Was it a harbinger of something more terrifying? JF believes it was a catalyst for a very disturbing dream a few nights later. I dreamed that I was in my room listening to music when it all of a sudden stopped, she recalls vividly. I looked at my iPod and it was still playing, but there was no sound. I looked at my door and there was a man in a black trench coat staring at me. It wasn't the fact that there was a man in my room that freaked me out. It was his face. It was red with black cracks all over, and he had horns. His eyes were a deep gold with no pupil, and he had long fangs coming out of his mouth. I just sat there staring at him. Then he said, It's time. And that's when I noticed a watch in his left hand. When he spoke, his breath came out as smoke and reeked of burning, spoiled meat. He made a grab for my neck, and that's when I woke up. The first smell that came to me was burning, spoiled meat. JF continues to be haunted by those connected experiences. I can never be outside now, not at night. Demons and ghosts exist outside. I have purified my room because it seems that's where I'm most vulnerable. These entities seem to appear when I'm trying to enjoy life. It was late October in Sofia, Bulgaria. That year, Halloween fell on a Saturday, and my friend Minchko was throwing a massive shindig at his parents' apartment. Now this guy was rich by Bulgarian standards, born into money. So when I say apartment, don't think of a typical, grotty Sofian flat. Think more along the lines of one of those unrealistically huge apartments from an American sitcom. His parents had gone away for the weekend, to either Spain or Italy, or somewhere else suitably warm, and as such, things were set to go wild. When the night finally rolled around, I dressed up in my zombie costume and set out to meet some friends. Minchko's invitation said that the party started at 8, so naturally, me and my group of chums didn't plan to arrive until 10. Gotta be fashionable. When we did arrive, most of the guests were already pretty drunk. The vodka was flowing freely, put it like that. They had a massive punch bowl, which was probably only 10% juice knowing Minchko. Some of us had a few midterm exams coming up, so we didn't want to go too wild. We just had a few beers, while everyone else pigged out on punch. Other than the people on my course, there was one other guy who wasn't really drinking that night. Some dude in a wolfman mask who was just hanging around the punch bowl. He didn't seem to know anybody at the party, and was keeping to himself. Looked a little awkward to be honest. The friendly half of me wanted to introduce myself, invite him to hang out with me and my friends. My socially anxious other half, however, decided against that. The night goes on, and one of the partiers starts to complain about having stomach pain. I figure he's overdone it. Some guys really can't handle their alcohol. He makes his way to the bathroom and starts vomiting. Not long afterwards, another guest starts complaining about the same problem. And then another. And another. Eventually, a dozen or so people are grabbing their stomachs in pain. Things start to seem serious, with some people even vomiting on the living room floor. A little worried, someone calls for medical assistance. At the hospital things turned out not to be an extreme instance of alcohol poisoning. Instead, we found out that the punch bowl contained a secret ingredient that someone had slipped in. It had been laced with rat poison. Thankfully, the dosage wasn't high enough to kill anyone immediately, but without treatment, the amount could have been fatal within a few hours. 
at a party full of drunk people. It was totally possible that no one would have been sober enough to react appropriately and call an ambulance. Somebody also could have easily passed out, not realizing that they'd been poisoned. Thankfully, though many were hospitalized, nobody ended up with any prolonged health issues. When we were questioned about what we all knew, the guy in the wolf mask came into my mind. He had been hanging around the punch bowl. I mentioned it to the police, and said that one of the other guests must have known who he was. Talking to my friends about it afterwards though, it seemed like nobody did know who he was. Everybody assumed that he was a friend of somebody else's, and didn't bother to question his attendance. As far as anybody could remember, nobody talked to him, nobody saw him without his mask on, and nobody even remembered who he turned up with, or even when he arrived at all. He had just slipped in unnoticed. To begin with, the police investigation turned up very little. It seemed as though it was just a one-off incident, some guy wanting to cause harm to a lot of people at once. But people like that rarely try this sort of thing only once. Almost one year later to the day, on the next Halloween weekend, the exact same thing happened at a party in a different part of town. This time, the amount of poison used was increased. Three people almost lost their lives that night, and ten were hospitalized. This time, however, the perpetrator was tackled by another partygoer who realized what he was up to. Under questioning, the police realized that the guy in the wolf mask was obviously a little disturbed in the head. He cited an event known as the Jonestown Massacre as his inspiration behind his actions. Looking into it, it turns out it was an event in the late 70s, where over 300 members of a cult died after being forced to drink from a poisoned punch bowl. This unstable nutjob wanted to pay homage to the largest mass suicide in history. For the first time in my life, I was damn thankful that I had exams coming up. I'm known for going a little bit wild at parties, and for trying to drink everyone under the table. Who's to say I wouldn't have chugged more poison punch than my body could have handled? Whenever Minchko hosts a Halloween party now, he always checks under everyone's mask at the door, just to make sure they're on the guest list. For context, I started an OnlyFans account over the summer to support myself through school. And things were great until I posted my Amazon wishlist on my OnlyFans page. Basically, the Amazon wishlist shows a list of Amazon items I'd eventually want, and people can buy them for me as a gift. Amazon doesn't release your address to people who gift you items, but third-party sellers can, and that's where things became creepy. This is a very scary story, and I feel like it should be shared. A couple of months ago, one night around 2 a.m., I took my dog right outside the house to go to the bathroom. While he was doing his business, I noticed a car parked outside my family home. I saw a figure in the car and could tell they were looking at me, but I couldn't make out their face because it was pitch black outside. Feeling a bit uneasy, I packed my dog to take him back inside, and as I started to move to go back inside, the car parked in my driveway. I sprinted back inside and locked the door, but they never approached my house. Weird. The next morning, I went outside to check the mail. There was an envelope addressed to my OnlyFans name with $20 inside of it. That's it. No note, just $20. I was still currently at home with my parents who had no idea about my OnlyFans account, so I didn't mention it to them. A week later, I moved to my college town to get ready to start school. At this time, I would stopped posting for the time being until I could figure out how they got my address. I've watched enough crime shows to know there's a possibility I could be in danger. For reference, I live in a duplex with a gated parking lot. So one morning, I was planning on vlogging my trip to Target because I was planning on starting a YouTube channel in the near future because OnlyFans felt unsafe. 
since I got started on the vlogs, I kept my camera in my car. So I left for Target, and when I got to my car, I realized it had been ransacked, and my vlogging camera was missing. I know, it's my fault for leaving it in my car, but I was using it the night before, and since I live in a gated area, I didn't think I'd be at risk of getting robbed in my car. It wasn't in plain sight either. I had hidden it in my glove box. I used that camera to film my content, and the SD card that was in there had all of my unreleased photos and video footage if I ever decided to make a channel. From that, I knew they stole my camera just for the SD card. Luckily, there are security cameras all around college campus, so a couple of days, I was able to watch the video recordings of exactly what happened that night. On the recordings, it was around 1 p.m., and I witnessed this man break into my car and find the camera. And he didn't touch any of the seven cars on the lot, so I guess he knew which car was mine, which suggests he had probably been stalking me for a while. After he got the camera, he walks around the duplex until stopping near my window. The bedroom faces an outside street, and my blinds are broken, so it's very easy to see in. I have a curtain, but it doesn't cover my window all the way. This person moved towards my bedroom window and stood there to watch me sleep. We sped up the footage times four and see him standing there for two hours. I have no idea why this person didn't try to break in, but thank God he didn't. I suddenly felt super paranoid and wanted to investigate this further. Since I knew the serial number of my camera, the police were able to find it. Apparently, the camera was sold to a pawn shop, but my SD card was missing. I believe the police are still trying to track this person down, but I broke my lease and moved to a new place, so hopefully that will keep me safe. So, I think this is all over. Since then, I haven't posted any more pictures on my OnlyFans account, but given that a guy became obsessed with me to the point of tracking down my address and watching me in my sleep, I don't know if starting a YouTube channel would be a good idea. This is a story from when I was alone in the house down the street from where I live now. I was home alone for the afternoon one summer day. It was towards the end of summer, so I was being lazy and watching TV in the living room. My parents were out somewhere, and my brother was at a friend's. I kept getting paranoid a bit, as I was only 15 at the time. I constantly checked out the windows and made sure the doors were locked, as I kept getting the feeling I was being watched. Then the noises began. I kept hearing thumps in the attic, and I got scared as the only way to the attic was through my closet in my room. As it only had a cover lid for it, I sat on the couch and tried to ignore the sounds. After a while, it stopped. But then I started to hear talking in the back room of the house. The weird part is no one was home. I put the TV on mute and it sounded like a male and female. So I got up and slowly went to the back room to check only to find no one there. By then, I was really scared. I ran to the living room and curled up sitting there in complete silence as I didn't know what to do. It was all right for a minute until I jumped by the sound of three knocks on the front door only five feet from my left. I reluctantly went to check through the peephole to find no one at the door or down the street. I immediately called my parents after that and they arrived an hour later. It was late at night in the same old house. Me and my brother were alone for the night when my parents went to eat. During the night, everything went as normal, but then I noticed things moving on their own. The washer would have its lid open right after I closed it. The keys would move and clothes would go missing. The scariest thing happened that night as I was going to bed. I looked outside my doorway to see a figure that appeared to be a shadow person standing there. I hid in my covers, and ever since then, I always sleep with my door closed at night.